Quick question before we get into tonight's story. Do you believe in ghosts? Very simple question. And I have a follow-up question after the story. So, without wasting any more time, let's get into tonight's tale. Two friends of mine, Hugh Granger and his wife, had taken for a month of Christmas holiday the house in which we were to witness such strange manifestations, and when I received an invitation from them to spend a fortnight there, I returned them an enthusiastic affirmative. Well, already did I know that pleasant, hearthy countryside and most intimate was my acquaintance with the subtle hazards of its most charming golf links. Golf, I was given to understand, was to occupy the solid day for Hugh and me, so that Margaret should never be obliged to set her hand on the implements which the game, so detestable to her, was conducted. I arrived there while yet the daylight lingered as my hosts were out. I took a ramble around the place. The house and garden stood on a plateau facing south. Below it were a couple of acres of pasture that sloped down to a vagrant stream crossed by a footbridge, by the side of which stood a thatched cottage with a vegetable patch surrounding it. A path ran close past this across the pasture from a wicket gate in the garden, conducted you over the footbridge, and, so my remembered sense of geography told me, must constitute a short cut to the links that lay not half a mile beyond. The cottage itself was clearly on the land of the little estate, and I at once supposed it to be the gardener's house. What went against so obvious and simple a theory was that it appeared to be unattended. No wreath of smoke, though the evening was chilly, curled from its chimneys, and coming closer, I fancied it had an air of waiting about it, which we so often conjure in unused habitations. There it stood, no sign of life whatsoever about it, though ready as its apparently perfect state of repair seemed to warrant for fresh tenants to put the breath of life into it again. Its little garden too, though, the palings were neat and newly painted, told the same tale. The beds were unattended, unweeded, and the inflower border by the front door was a row of chrysanthemums which had withered on their stems. But all this was but the impression of a moment, and I did not pause as I passed it, but crossed the footbridge and went on up the heathery slope that lay beyond. My geography was not at fault, for presently I saw the clubhouse just in front of me. Hugh, no doubt, would be just about coming from his afternoon round, and so we'd walk back together. On reaching the clubhouse, however, the steward told me that not five minutes before Miss Granger had called in a car for her husband, and I therefore retraced my steps by the path along which I'd already come. But I made a detour, as a golfer will, to walk up the fairway of the 17th and 18th holes just for the pleasure of recognition, and looked respectfully at the yawning sand pitch. To walk up the fairway of the 17th and 18th holes just for the pleasure of recognition, and looked respectfully at the yawning sand pit which so inexorably guards the 18th green, wondering in what circumstances I should visit it next, whether with a step complacent and superior, knowing that my ball reposed safely on the green beyond, or with the heavy footfall of one who knows that laborious delving lies before him. The light of the winter evening had faded fast, and when I crossed the footbridge on my return, the dusk had gathered. To my right, just beside the path, lay the cottage, the whitewashed walls of which gleamed whitely in the gloaming, and as I turned my glance back from it to the rather narrow plank which bridged the stream, I thought I caught out the tail of my eye some light from one of its windows, which thus disproved my theory that it was unattended. But when I looked directly at it again, I saw that I was mistaken. Some reflection in the glass of the red lines of sunset in the west must have deceived me, for the inclement twilight it looked more desolate than ever. Yet I lingered by the wicked gate, and its low palings, for though all exterior evidence bore witness to its emptiness, some inexplicable feeling assured me quite irrationally 
that this was not so, and that there was somebody in there. Certainly there was no one visible, but, so this absurd idea informed me, he might be at the back of the cottage, concealed from me by the intervening structure, and still, oddly, still unreasonably, it became a matter of importance to my mind to ascertain whether this was so or not. So clearly had my perceptions told me that the place was empty, and so firmly had some conviction assured me that it was tenanted. To cover my inquisitiveness, in case there were someone out there, I could inquire whether this path was a shortcut to the house at which I was staying, and rather rebelling at what I was doing, I went through the small garden and rapped at the door. There was no answer, and after waiting for a response to a second summons and having tried the door and found it locked, I made the circuit of the house. Of course, there was no one there, and told myself that I was just like a man who looks under the bed for a burglar and would be beyond measure astonished if he found one. My hosts were at the house when I arrived, and we spent a cheerful two hours before dinner in such desultory and eager conversation as is proper between friends who have not met for some time. Between Hugh Granger and his wife, it is always impossible to light on a subject which does not vividly interest one or the other of them. Golf, politics, the needs of Russia, cooking ghosts, and the possible victory over Mount Everest and the income tax were among the topics which we passionately discussed. With all these plates spinning, it was easy to whip up any one of them, and the subject of spooks generally was lighted up again and again. Margaret is on the high road to madness, remarked Hugh on one of those occasions, for she's begun using a planchette. If you use a planchette for six months, I'm told, most careful doctors will conscientiously certify you as insane. She's got five months before she goes to Bedlam. <laughs> Does it work? I asked. Yes, it says the most interesting things, said Margaret. It says things that never entered my head. We'll try it tonight. No, not tonight, said Hugh. Let's have an evening off. Margaret disregarded this. It's no use asking Planchette questions, she went on, because there's in your mind some sort of answer to them. If I ask whether it will be fine tomorrow, for instance, it is probably I, though indeed I don't mean to push, who makes the pencil say yes. And then it usually rains, remarked Hugh. Not always. Don't interrupt. The interesting thing is to let the pencil write what it chooses. Very often it only makes loops and curves, though they may mean something, and every now and then a word comes of the significance in which I have no idea, whatever, so I clearly couldn't have suggested it. Yesterday evening, for instance, it wrote gardener over and over again. Now, what does that mean? The gardener here is a Methodist with a chin beer. Could it have been him? It's time to dress. Please, don't be late. My cook is so sensitive about soup. We rose, and some connection of ideas about Gardner linked itself up in my mind. By the way, what's that cottage in the field by the footbridge? I asked. Is that the Gardner's cottage? It used to be, said Hugh. But he doesn't live there. In fact, nobody lives there. It's empty. If I was the owner here, I'd put the gardener back into it and take the rent off his wages. Some people have no idea of economy. <laughs> Why do you ask? I saw Margaret was looking at me rather attentively. Curiosity, I said. Just idle curiosity. I don't believe it was, she said. <laughs> but it was, I said. It was idle curiosity to know whether the house was inhabited. As I passed it going down to the clubhouse, I felt sure it was empty, but coming back I felt so sure that there was someone there that I rapped at the door and indeed walked around it. Hugh had preceded us upstairs as she lingered a little. And there was no one there, she asked. It's odd. I had just the same feeling as you about it. That explains Planchette writing Gardner over and over again, said I. You had the gardener's cottage on your mind. Oh, how ingenious, said Margaret. Hurry up and dress. 
A gleam of strong moonlight between my drawn curtains when I went up to bed that night led me to look out. My room faced the garden and the fields which I had traversed that afternoon, and all was vividly illuminated by the moon. The thatched cottage with its white walls closed by the stream was very distinct. Once more, I suppose, the reflection of the light on the glass of one of its windows made it appear that the room was lit within. It struck me as odd that twice that day this illusion should have been presented to me. And now, a yet odder thing happening. Even as I looked, the light was extinguished. The morning did not at all bear the fine promise of the clear night, for when I woke, the wind was squealing and sheets of rain from the southwest were dashed against my panes. Golf was wholly out of the question, and though the violence of the storm abated a little in the afternoon, the rain dripped with steady sullenness. But I wearied of indoors, and since the two others entirely refused to step foot outside, I went forth Macintosh to get a breath of air. By way of an object in my tramp, I took the road to the links in preference to the muddy shortcut through the fields, with the intention of engaging a couple of caddies for Hugh and myself next morning, and lingered a while over illustrated papers in the smoking room. I must have read for longer than I knew, for a sudden beam of sunset light suddenly illuminated my page, and looking up I saw that the rain had ceased, and that evening was fast coming on. So instead of taking the long detour by the road again, I set forth homewards on the path by across the fields. That gleam of sunset was the last of the day, and once again, just as twenty-four hours ago, I crossed the footbridge in the gloaming. Till that moment, as far as I was aware, I had not thought at all about the cottage there, but now, in a flash, the light I had seen there last night suddenly extinguished recalled itself to my mind, and at that same moment I felt that invincible conviction that the cottage had someone inside. Simultaneously in these swift processes of thought I looked toward it and saw standing by the door the figure of a man. In the dusk I could distinguish nothing of his face, if indeed it was turned to me, and only got the impression of a tallish fellow, thickly built, he opened the door from which there came a dim light as of a lamp, entered, and shut it after him. So then my conviction was right. Yet I'd been distinctly told that the cottage was empty. Who then was he that entered as if returning home? Once more, this time, with a certain qualm of fear, I rapped on the door, intending to put some trivial questions. I rapped again this time more drastically so that there could be no question that my summons was unheard. But still, I got no reply, and finally I tried the handle of the door. It was locked. Then, with difficulty mastering and increasing terror, I made the circuit of the cottage, peering into each unshuttered window. All was dark within, though, but two minutes ago I'd seen the gleam of light escape from the open door. Just because some chain of conjecture was beginning to form itself in my mind, I made no allusion to this odd adventure, and after dinner, Margaret, amid protests from Hugh, got out the planchette which had persisted in writing Gardner. My surmise was, of course, utterly fantastic, but I wanted to convey no suggestion of any sort to Margaret. For a long time, the pencil skated over her paper, making loops and curves and peaks like a temperature chart, and she began to yawn and weary over her experiment before any coherent word emerged. And then, in the oddest way, her head nodded forward, and she seemed to have fallen asleep. Hugh looked up from his book and spoke in a whisper to me. She fell asleep the other night over it, he said. Margaret's eyes were closed, and she breathed the long, quiet breaths of slumber, and then her hand began to move with a curious firmness. 
Right across the big sheet of paper went a level line of writing, and at the end her hand stopped with a jerk, and she woke. She looked at the paper. Hello, she said. One of you has been playing a trick on me. We assured her that this was not so, and she read what she had written. Gardener, gardener, it ran. I'm the gardener. I want to come in. I can't find her here. Oh, Lord, that gardener again, said Hugh. Looking up from the paper, I saw Margaret's eyes fixed on mine, and even before she spoke, I knew what her thought was. Did you come home by the cottage? she asked. Yes. Why? Still empty? she said in a low voice. Or... or anything else? I did not want to tell her what I'd just seen, or what at any rate I thought I had seen. If there was going to be anything odd or anything worth observation, it was far better that our respective impressions should not fortify each other. I tapped again and there was no answer, I said. Presently, there was a move to bed. Margaret initiated it, and after she'd gone upstairs, Hugh and I went to the front door to interrogate the weather. Once more, the moon shone in a clear sky, and we strolled out along the flagged path that fronted the house. Suddenly, Hugh turned quickly and pointed to the angle of the house. Who on earth is that? he said. Look, there, he's going around the corner. I had but a glimpse of a tallish man, of heavy build. Didn't you see him? asked Hugh. I'll just go around the house and find him. I don't want anyone prowling around us at night. Wait here, will you? And if he comes around the other corner, ask him what his business is. Hugh had left me in our stroll, close by the front door, which was open, and there I waited until he should have made his circuit. He'd hardly disappeared when I heard, quite distinctly, a rather quick but heavy footfall coming along the paved walk toward me from the opposite direction. But there was absolutely no one to be seen who made the sound of rapid walking. Closer and closer to me came the steps of the Invisible One, and then with a shudder of horror I felt somebody unseen push by me as I stood on the threshold. That shudder was not merely of the spirit for the touch of him was that of ice on my hand. I tried to seize this impalpable intruder, but he slipped from me, and next moment I heard his steps on the parquet of the floor inside. Some door then opened and shut, and I heard no more of him. Next moment, Hugh came running around the corner of the house from which the sound of steps had approached. Where is he? he asked. He was not twenty yards in front of me, a big tall fellow. I saw nobody, I said. I heard a step along the walk, but there was nothing to be seen. And then, asked Hugh, whatever it was seemed to brush by me and go into the house, said I. There had certainly been no sound of steps on the bare oak stairs, and we reached room after room through the ground floor of the house. The dining room door and that of the smoking room were locked. That into the drawing room was open. The only other door which could have furnished the impression of an opening and shutting was that into the kitchen and the servants' quarters. Here again our quest was fruitless. Through pantry and scullery and boot room and servants' hall we searched, but all was empty and quiet. Finally we came to the kitchen, which too was empty. But by the fire... There was set a rocking chair, and this was oscillating to and fro as if someone, lately sitting there, had just quitted it. There it stood, gently rocking, and this seemed to convey the sense of a presence invisible now, more than even the sight of him who surely had been sitting there could have done. I remember wanting to steady it and stop it, and yet my hand refused to go forth to it. 
what we had seen, and in especial what we had not seen, would have been sufficient to furnish most people with a broken night, and assuredly I was not among the strong-minded exceptions. Long I lay wide-eyed and open-eared, and when at last I dozed, I was plucked from the borderland of sleep by the sound, muffled but unmistakable, of someone moving about the house. It occurred to me that the steps might be those of Hugh conducting a lonely exploration, but even while I wondered, a tap came at the door of communication between our rooms, and in answer to my response, it appeared that he had come to see whether it was I thus uneasily wandering. Even as we spoke, the step passed my door, and the stairs leading to the floor above creaked to its ascent. Next moment it sounded directly above our heads in some attics in the roof. Those are not the servants' bedrooms, said Hugh. No one sleeps up there. Let us look once more. It must be somebody. With lit candles, we made our stealthy way upstairs, and just when we were at the top of the flight, Hugh, a step ahead of me, uttered a sharp explanation. Something's passing by me he said, and he clutched at the empty air. Even as he spoke, I experienced the same sensation, and the moment afterwards, the stairs below us creaked again as the unseen passed down. All night long, that sound of steps moved about the passages as if someone was searching the house, and as I lay and listened, that message which had come through the pencil of the planned chat to Margaret's fingers occurred to me. I want to come in. I cannot find her here. Indeed, someone had come in and was sedulous in his search. He was the gardener, he would seem. But what gardener was this invisible seeker and for whom did he seek? Even as when some bodily pain ceases, it is difficult to recall with any vividness what the pain was like. So next morning, as I dressed, I found myself vainly trying to recapture the horror of the spirit which had accompanied these nocturnal adventures. I remembered that something within me had sickened as I watched the movements of the rocking chair the night before, and as I heard the steps along the paved way outside, and by that invisible pressure against me knew that someone had entered the house. But now, in the sane and tranquil morning, and all day under the serene winter sun, I could not realize what had been seen. The presence, like the bodily pain, had to be there for the realization of it, and all day it was absent. Hugh felt the same. He was even disposed to be humorous on the subject. Well, he's had good luck, he said, whoever he is and whoever he's looking for. By the way, not a word to Margaret, please. She heard nothing of these preambulations, nor the entry of... of whatever it was. No gardener, anyhow. Whoever heard of a gardener spending this much time walking about the house? If there were steps over the potato patch, I might have been with you. Margaret had arranged to drive over to have tea with some friends of hers that afternoon, and in consequence, Hugh and I refreshed ourselves at the clubhouse after our game, and it was already dusk when, for the third day in succession, I passed homewards by the whitewashed cottage. But tonight, I had no sense of it being subtly occupied. It stood mournfully desolate, as is the way of an unattended house, and no light nor semblance of such gleamed from its windows. Hugh, to whom I had told the odd impressions I had received there, gave them a reception as flippant as that which he had accorded to the memories of the night, and he was still being humorous about them when we came to the door of the house. Psychic disturbance, old boy, he said, like a cold in the head. Hello, the door's locked. He rang and rapped, and from inside came the noise of a turned key and withdrawn bolts. What's the door locked for? he asked. The man shifted from one foot to the other. The bell rang half an hour ago, sir, he said. When I came to answer it, there was a man standing outside, and... Well? asked Hugh. 
I didn't like the looks of him, sir, he said. I asked him his business. He didn't say anything, and then he must have gone pretty smartly away, for I never saw him go. Where'd he seem to go? Said Hugh, glancing over at me. I can't rightly say. He didn't seem to go at all. Something seemed to brush by me. That'll do, said Hugh rather sharply. Margaret had not come in from her visit, but when soon after the crunch of the motor wheels was heard, Hugh reiterated his wish that nothing should be said to her about the impression which now, apparently, a third person had shared with us. She came in with a flush of excitement on her face. Never laugh at my plan chat again, she said. I've had the most extraordinary story from Maud Ashfield. Horrible, but so frightfully interesting. Out with it said Hugh. Well, there was a gardener here, she said. He used to live in that little college by the footbridge and where the family were up in London, he and his wife used to be caretakers and lived there. Hugh's glance and mine met, and then he turned away. I knew as certainly as if I was in his mind that his thoughts were identical with my own. He married a wife much younger than himself, continued Margaret and gradually he became frightfully jealous of her, and one day, in a fit of passion, he strangled her with his own hands. A little while after, someone came to the cottage and found him sobbing over her, trying to restore her. They went for the police, but before they came, he'd cut his own throat. Isn't it all horrible? But surely it's rather curious that the planchette said, Gardener, I'm the gardener. I want to come in. I can't find her here. You see, I knew nothing about it. I shall do planchette again tonight. Oh, dear me. The post goes in half an hour, and I have a whole budget to send. But respect my plan, chat for the future, Yugi. We talked the situation out when she had gone, but Hugh, unwillingly convinced and yet unwilling to admit that something more than coincidence lay behind that plan, chat nonsense, still insisted that Margaret should be told nothing of what we had heard and seen in the house last night and of the strange visitor who again this evening, so we must conclude, had made his entry. She'll be frightened, he said, and she'll begin imagining things. As for the planchette, as likely as not, it will do nothing but scribble and make loops. What's that? Yes, come in. There had come from somewhere in the room one sharp, peremptory rap. I did not think it'd come from the door, but Hugh, with no response, replied to his words of admittance, jumped up and opened it. He took a few steps into the hall outside and returned. Didn't you hear it? he asked. Certainly. Was no one there? Not a soul. Hugh came back to the fireplace and rather irritably threw a cigarette, which he had just lit, into the fender. That was a rather nasty jar, he observed. If you ask me whether I feel comfortable, I can tell you that I've never felt less comfortable in my life. I'm frightened, if you want to know, and I believe you are too. I hadn't the smallest intention of denying this, and he went on. We've got to keep a hand on ourselves, he said. There's nothing so infectious as fear, and Margaret mustn't catch it from us. But there's something more than our fear, you know. Something has got into the house, and we're up against it. I never believed in such things before, but let's face it a minute. What is it, anyhow? If you want to know what I think it is, said I, I believe it to be the spirit of the man who strangled his wife and then cut his throat. I don't see how he can hurt us. We're afraid of our own fear, really. But we're up against it, said Hugh. And what'll it do? Good Lord, if I only knew what it would do, I shouldn't mind. It's the not knowing. It's time to dress. Margaret was in her highest spirits at dinner, knowing nothing of the manifestations of that presence which had taken place in the last 24 hours. She thought it absorbingly interesting that her planchette should have guessed, so ran her phrase, about the gardener, and from that topic she fitted to an equally interesting form of patience, 
number three, which her friends had showed her, promising to initiate us into it after dinner. This she did, and not knowing that we both, above all things, wanted to keep Planchette at a distance, she was delighted with the success of her game. But suddenly as she observed that the evening was burning rapidly away and swept the cards together at the conclusion of a hand. Now, just a half hour of Planchette, she said. Oh, maiden, we play one more hand, asked Hugh. It's the best game I've seen for years. Planchat will dismally slow after this. Darling, if the gardener will only communicate again, it won't be slow, said she. But it's such drivel, said Hugh. How rude you are. Read your book, then. Margaret had already gotten out her machine and a sheet of paper when Hugh rose. Please don't do it tonight, Margaret, he said. But why? You needn't attend. Well, I asked you not to, anyhow, said he. Margaret looked at him closely. Huey, you've got something on your mind, she said. Out with it. I believe you're nervous. You think there's something queer about it. Is that it? I could see Hugh hesitating as to whether to tell her or not, and I gathered that he chose the chance of her planchette inanely scribbling. Go on, then, he said. Margaret hesitated. She clearly did not want to vex Hugh, but his insistence must have seemed to her most unreasonable. Just ten minutes, she said, and I promise not to think of gardeners. She had hardly laid her hand on the board when her head fell forward and the machine began moving. I was sitting close to her, and it rolled steadily along the paper. The writing became visible. I have come in, it ran, but I still can't find her. Are you hiding her? I will search the room where you are. What else was written but still concealed underneath the planchette I do not know, for at the moment a current of icy air swept around the room and the door, this time unmistakably, came a loud knock. Hugh sprang to his feet. Margaret, wake up, he said. Something is coming. The door opened, and there moved in the figure of a man. He stood just within the door, his head bent forward as he turned it from side to side, peering, it would seem, with eyes staring and infinitely sad into every corner of the room. Margaret! Margaret! cried Hugh again. But Margaret's eyes were open, too. They were fixed on this dreadful visitor. Be quiet, Huey, she said below her breath, rising as she spoke. The ghost was now looking directly at her. Once the lips above the thick, rust-colored beer moved, and no sound came forth. The mouth only moved and slavered. He raised his head in horror upon horror. I saw that one side of his neck was laid open in a red, glistening gash. For how long that pause continued, when we all three stood stiff and frozen in some deadly inhibition to move or speak, I have no idea. I suppose that at the utmost it was a dozen seconds. And then the specter turned and went out as it had come. We heard his steps pass along the parketed floor. It was the sound of bolts withdrawn from the front door, and with a crash that shook the house, it slammed too. It's all over, said Margaret. God, have mercy on him. Now, the reader may put precisely what construction he pleases on this visitation from the dead. He need not, indeed, consider it to have been a visitation from the dead at all, but say that there had been impressed on that scene where this murder and suicide happened, some sort of emotional record which in certain circumstances could translate itself into images visible and invisible. Waves of ether or what not may conceivably retain the impress of such scenes. They may be held, so to speak, in solution, ready to be precipitated. Nor he may hold that the spirit of the dead man indeed made itself manifest, revisiting in some sort of spiritual penance and remorse the place where his crime was committed. Naturally, 
No materialist will entertain such an explanation for an instant, but then there is no one abstainly unreasonable as the materialist. Beyond doubt, a dreadful deed was done there, and Margaret's last utterance is not inapplicable. So, now that you've heard the story of Margaret and the gardener, do you believe in ghosts? Obviously, this is a fictional story, but do you think something like this could happen for real, in real life? And if so, what do you think it is? Do you think it is some sort of residual energy showing itself? Do you think it's something much more complicated than that? Let me know down in the comment section below. And also, have you ever, or would you ever, participate in a seance? I think I know the answer for most of you, because my answer would probably match that. Absolutely not. I don't necessarily believe in the supernatural, in ghosts, in spirits, in anything that has to do with that specifically. However, I'm also not going to risk it, if that makes any sense. It may sound silly. Say, you don't believe in it. Why, why wouldn't you risk it? Because I, it's not necessarily I don't believe. It's more of I don't know. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Thank you all so, so much for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful day, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And as always, stay safe out there.